turn this on. All right, this uh, picture is a photograph from Real Foot Lake I made, and it, it's actually two photographs that put together, and one of them is flipped, so they match and become symmetrical images. Uh, but uh, I, I like that scene, I just love it. That's going to serve as our background today. Um, our lesson is let him use you to touch others. And it is a lesson concerning how we live effectively for God as a Christian. How is it we fulfill his desires for us, I guess? It's a very simple lesson. It should take us too long to get through. I want you to imagine somebody going to college and they spend four years and like us. Uh, my son did five years, and my daughter eight years, and others 10, 12, 14 years in school being trained. And they get through with school and don't do anything with what they did. You probably say, well, there's a lot of wasted time, a lot of wasted life, and a lot of wasted money. Uh, well, what if we go through life as a Christian and don't do anything with what God is planning for us to do. Because God has planned on your outline for our spiritual development. And it comes in the form of you need to become like him. And, and we talked about that as we go through the, the fruit of the spirit and develop those characteristics. It's like God. And you need to take that which you have and you need to live for him so that you are effectively Changing the lives of, of those who are around you and changing your own life. Now, if you get that principle and as a biblical principles, you got the lesson, okay? Well, today I want to carry you further than just becoming a Christian. I want you to uh, let Him use you to touch others because we are touched by God daily and that needs to spill over into the lives of those who are around us. Let's get some principles from the scriptures. First one comes from Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. It's in the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Understand that the light is the light that comes from God. When we walk in the light, as He is in the light, it is an association with God. It is uh, your, your relationship. And so you get light. You get brightness. You get the effervescence from God. You get the uh, so far above the world is where you were brought to. And he says you are to let that be seen. There is relationship with other people. The other people are seeing the change that takes place in you. He says to take that light and, and you do good works. And we're going to see that evidence. Not that you're earning your way to heaven. Not that you're even taking brownie points for the good stuff you do. But that by you doing what you want to do because you're being transformed into his image, it will be something good that they will see. And the reaction will be that they know you are a Christian and they glorify God. Now you and I both know sometimes that doesn't work quite like that. It happens. Because we have an adversary in the world. And he's going to take what you do and he's going to construe it so that the world understands something differently. But if they understood what was going on in your heart, what was going on in your relationship to God, the only thing they could do would be to glorify God for it. But it doesn't always work that way because Satan's here. The next passage is the You Need It Unto Me passage. <laughs> it comes from the 25th chapter of Matthew, and in verse 40, Jesus talks about how that they had fed him and they clothed him and they visited him and they take care of him. Lord, when did we see you in that, that, in that situation? When did we do that to you? And as much as you did it unto one of the least of these, you did it unto me. 
The other passage is a negative of that. It's verse 45, the same passage. As much as you did not do it unto the least of these, you did it not unto me. Now you can't read that without understanding that there is a relationship with other people there. There is a, a connection of you interacting into their lives. Now remember Jesus is teaching his disciples. Wow. The final passage on that is Matthew 28, 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. And we call this the Great Commission. But look at what it says. I am to go among the nations. And I am to teach them, I am to lead them, I am to guide them, so that the result is that they are baptized. You can't look at this command, Dale, and say baptism is not necessary. This command says God's expected end to our teaching others is that they would be baptized. Can you understand that? Does that make sense? Well, so far as this lesson goes, the thing that we want you to get is that the connection of you to other people's salvation. All three of these illustrations tells us that God expects us to be involved in the lives of others. Now from that I get that I cannot be a hermit and please God. That's just a conclusion. I cannot take what God has given me and how God has blessed me and turn it internal without sharing it. It has to be. So the disciples carried this command out. You know the passages in Acts chapter 2 where the, the whole world was gathered together there in Jerusalem on that day of Pentecost and Peter stood up and began preaching. The Bible says in verse 42, there were 3,000 of them that were led to Christ. And verse 42 says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. You can't read that without understanding that the disciples were together. And the way it's worded, I believe that they were together every day. I don't think they waited because they didn't have the scriptures to read. They didn't have the, the uh, ability to, to listen to tapes or to listen to the radio to get in their faith. They had to be together to strengthen and encourage and not uplift one another. I suggest to you that there is a need for worship for us to come together to be strengthened, to be uplifted, to be a part of one another's lives. And by the way, I did not see you here when I came in. Carmel, I am so thankful you were able to be here. I told Vivian at about 11 o'clock last night, I haven't even called Carmel. I apologize to you publicly. I'm glad you're able to be here. Thank the Lord for answering our prayers. They were together. And this fellowship piece is what says that. It was believers touching one another's lives in the name of God. And I should have put in the name of God on there. That's what it is. We come together for his purpose. We come together because we believe. We come together because we want to be a part of the family of God. In the rest of the book of Acts, they went everywhere preaching the word and the church group. Listen to what it says. When you become a part of the lives of the people and you are doing what you need to do, then the church will grow. We need to let our lives, our lights shine before people. 
so that they will see our good works and in turn will glorify God. And when you do, the church is going to grow. Do you remember the real name of the book of Acts? Praxis. You remember that study? It was all about what God was doing among his people. Not what the apostles was doing, but what the what that God was doing for them. So when Paul came back off of his missionary journeys and he revert, rehearsed all that Paul did. No, it's not what it says. Paul came back and told them about that missionary journey and the Bible says all that God was doing through him. That's what it's about. And that's what our lives need to be about. So let's boil this down and get this into my language so I can understand it, okay? Live for the Lord. <laughs> That's as simple and plain as you can have it. Live for the Lord. Make your faith be the guide to your life. I believe in Jesus, therefore, some things are going to happen and some things are not going to happen. Because I believe in Jesus, I'm going to worship Him. Because I believe in Jesus, I will do what I need to do to try to help those who need my help. And trust in God to bless me in it. Because I believe in Jesus, I will not go some places. I will not do some things. And I will not participate in some things. And I don't think he need me to start doing enumerated, Don, because I couldn't get that whole list done, could I? But let my faith be my guide. Make the Lord the center of your life. What this piece says is that there are a lot of things in this world that are important, but there's nothing as important as the Lord. There are a lot of things that need attention to, but there's nothing any more important than attending unto the Lord. There are a lot of things that I need to be done. But I don't have anything as important as the Lord. And when your life is based with Him in the center, then the things that He wants you to do will come first and they will get done and then He will see that the rest is taken care of. Lord, you're it. Y'all remember the uh, series that I preached here on the names of God? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> well, I'm starting that in my Sunday school class at Springville this morning. One of the things that I <coughs> wanted them to know today was that if you take God out, you take Christ out, you don't have any faith. You don't have any life. There is no world, and there is no universe. And I tried to impress those facts on them today so they can get ready to give him the glory and the honor that they need to give. Well, I want you to know, until Christ becomes the center of your life, you can't do that. You won't do that. You won't even want to do that. Good friend of mine, Used to go to church in spring. He didn't go anymore. He used to lead in prayer. He used to teach Sunday school class. He used to wait on the table. He was very active. He used to help me with a bullet. He didn't go anymore. Period. I said, come on. You, you know what's right. He said, Charlie, you can't tell me anything that the scripture says that I don't already know. I'm not good. I don't know. Maybe I couldn't. What he was saying to me is, I just simply don't want to do that anymore. And I know I have chosen the wrong life. 
Listen. And I know if I die today, I will be going to hell. How sad is that? This man is a prominent business leader, civic leader in our county. I don't even want to do that anymore. What happened? He told me, because my family wants me to do this, this, and this, I can't be a Christian anymore. And he has chosen family over Christ. And he told me, he put it in those words. Don't any of you choose anybody above the Lord. Put him in the center of your life. Be aware of his presence in all you do because he's there. As I laid out the, the, the presence of Christ for the people at Springville this morning, I said, He is there in creation. I quoted from John chapter 1. It says there was nothing made that was made without Him. He's there. And you go all the way through the Bible to the close of Revelation. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. And from beginning to end, our Lord is present. Put him in the center of your life, all you do. And when the opportunity arises and it presents itself, just simply tell the story of what Jesus means to you. You don't have to sit down with any big Bible study. You don't have to know a whole category of scriptures. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Because when Jesus enters in, life gets better. Your evidence today is going to stand as our closure. And I know this may be a little bit short, but there's a lot in this, so you may be holding your song for a while. It's not the mission trips that you may go on. Those are fine. Now, those are scriptural. They're wonderful. And some people may be saved because you go on them. And we need more people who are willing to go. I've been on five. I don't anticipate at my age going anymore, Gerald. But I might. You never can tell. But that's not what it's about. What it is about is it's the day-to-day -day relationships that you have. Every one of us have relationships. We have friends. We have neighbors. We have family. Work cohorts. We have all kinds of relationships in this world. And it is about in those relationships having an influence. So you need to ask yourself because I am here and in this relationship, have I made it better or have I made it worse? Have I led people closer to God or have I set an example why you don't want to be a Christian? What is my influence in the relationships that I have? Because where I want to grow to and where I want to be is I want those people in those relationships to pay attention and say, oh, this is what Christ looks like. And that is scriptural because Paul says you are being changed into his image. You've been changed. So I want to grow to the point that those people who are around me will see me and say, that's what Christ would do. That's how Christ would feel. That's how Christ would interact and react to the negative things of this world. Personal story. When my director of school set me down and told me he could no longer afford me and he was going to give me 50 days, train somebody to take my place, it was kind of like what went through my mind was, you're being slowly fired. <laughs> and I joked with that around. Now, I I can react with this with a very negative kind of context, or I can set the example of Christ himself. So he was led as a sheep under the slaughter. Yet he opened not his mouth. 
And so what I said was, you're the boss. Whatever you say goes. That's the only reaction a Christian can make. Influence among other people. You had it. What's it like? And if your influence comes so that they see Christ living in you, then God will be drawing men to him through you. He will be using you to touch their lives to change it for better. What's this about? It's about quietly going about and doing good. It's not about getting up on a soapbox and tooting your horn. We had this many people that we fed this week. No. That's not what it's about. It's about doing things so that your left hand does not know what your right hand is doing. Doing good in His name. It's about thanking the Lord for the opportunities you have. To serve him in the lives of other people. And it's about making choices based on your faith. Because I'm a Christian. This is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to be. This is how I'm going to feel. And you need to prepare your mind that for whatever comes your way. Because the negative things are going to come. Whatever comes my way, I will be a Christian. I will react how God wants me to react. I will not be emotional about it. I had a girl this week sit in my living room and we talked for a while about her relationship with her husband. And in that relationship, she says, I can't stand him. And she just got emotional and worked up and whoa, whoa, whoa. That's why he's acting the way he's acting. You need to stop that. Because you are a Christian. Sometimes somebody needs to tell me, Charlie, you need to stop that. Because you're a Christian. Let us grow to where we do good. Because we thank him for the opportunities. And so that we make choices based upon our faith. It is guiding the lost closer to him. You may never make people become Christians, but just, would you go to church with me? Do you know what the Bible says about that? Let me help you in this. It is soothing the hurting because we've got an awful lot of people that are hurting. Like I say, four funerals this weekend and they were sorrowful and you comfort them just by being there and listening to them. It's doing all of this not because you're so good all caps because God is so good. It is your response to him in life. It's given him the glory and not this church and not you or not some organization. It is thank you, God. It is really letting your light so shine before me that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Is he touching people around you, through you? Well, you need to know something. 